Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Mervalli. My friends in Jesus and Mary, we are approaching the month of May, which is, of course, the month of the mother. And I want to talk about the full truth about the mother. Why is that so important? Because without the full truth of who Our Lady is, you're not going to have a proportionate love for who she is. Without the truth, the whole truth about Mary, uh, it's going to limit your ability to appreciate her as much as Jesus does. And even though none of us, none of us will appreciate Our Lady as much as her divine son does, we're supposed to try. We're supposed to, throughout our lives, try to love her more because we know her, her beauty, her majesty, her dignity more. And so we're going to talk about a subject we've talked about many times in Mary Alive, and that is a solemn proclamation of the truth, the whole truth about Our Lady in relationship to you and to me, that she is the spiritual mother of all peoples, in a special way Christians, but not exclusively Christians, all peoples, all the peoples that Jesus died for on Calvary, which is truly all peoples of history, in her three roles as Corinthians, Mediatrix, and Advocate. Now, some of you may have heard me talk about the Fifth Marian Dogma before, certainly if you are a, a follower of, of Mary Live. But I want to go through seven reasons, and I, and I ask you to, to stay with me and, and really to pray with me through this, because these seven reasons have never been more necessary in the life of the church and in the needs of the world. Uh, that's not historical hyperbole. That's just the reality. We are facing unprecedented challenges for, for all who are really doing an honest examination of what's taking place uh, in our society. And that means for an, in an unprecedented way, we need the remedy. My friends, she is the remedy. The mother is the remedy. And proclaiming the full truth about the mother is the remedy. Why? Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has given Our Lady the task, the mission to bring peace to the world. We, we know this from Fatima. We know it from history, for goodness sake. Every time the church is in trouble, it pleads to Our Lady and, and runs to her as advocate, asking for her petition, asking for her mediation, in virtue of the fact that she, like no other creature, participated with Jesus in the obtaining of the graces of redemption. So who more appropriate to distribute those graces to us, especially at times of need? And right now, my friends, we are a time of grave need. Once again, I think it can be defended sociologically and psychologically and geopolitically and certainly spiritually that things have never been worse since Jesus walked the earth. There's never been a, a more existential rejection of basic natural law, let alone divine revelation, but just the basic concept of an objective good and, and evil. This is gone. Uh, th this has been lost uh, for, for the majority of Western society. We need the mother. We need her remedy. We need her peace, the peace that can only come through her intercession. But we've got to freely acknowledge her first before that to happen. And that's why I encourage you to listen through these seven points. I ask you to send this video just to one other person, one other person who loves Our Lady but perhaps doesn't understand the importance of a solemn papal definition of her role as spiritual mother of all people. Ask Our Lady to bring that person to your heart. One other person, you can uh, forward this video uh, as we talk about why is this so necessary. So let's go through seven reasons. Seven reasons why this is the time for the Holy Father to proclaim a new Marian dogma. And let's start by uh, reiterating that the first four Marian dogmas, that she's mother of God, 431 Council of Ephesus, uh, her perpetual virginity, 649 uh, the Lateran Council, her immaculate conception defined by, by Blessed Pius IX in 1854, and her assumption, 1950, uh, defined solemnly by Pius XII. All those beautiful dogmas deal with her earthly prerogatives, her life on earth. Now it's time to define her relationship with you and me. Isn't it extraordinary that even though it's a doctrinal teaching of the church, it's not been a solemnly proclaimed truth that Mary's your spiritual mother. 
And yet most everything we do in, re in relation to Our Lady presupposes that. Like what? Like the rosary, like Mary in consecration, like the scapular. That all presupposes that she is our spiritual mother for those to have an efficacy, for those to have a supernatural power. And that's the task that Jesus gave her as his final uh, disposition for the mother at Calvary, right? Woman, behold your son, John, to, and then to John, behold your mother. From that moment, after she participates with Jesus as the human co-redemptrix, with the divine co-redemptrix, Jesus as, as no human could ever match or ever compete, let alone be equated with the divine redeemer. That's nonsense. It's heresy. It's blasphemy. Oh, but God did want a human being to participate. And that's her role as the co-redemptrix. And so that woman would be given as spiritual mother of all peoples to humanity so that we would have a mother. It's time that that be defined. So let's go through the seven reasons. Number one, a historic release of grace. My friends, a brief purview of history will show you that with every Marian dogma comes a measurable historic release of grace. This was very evident, for example, with the definition of the Immaculate Conception. It's 1849. The Pope is in exile, uh, a socialist uh, and Masonic army uh, comes to, to, to root him out of the Vatican city-states and, and out of the papacy. And so from exile, after uh, consultation with cardinals, he declares the definition of the Immaculate Conception. He, he, he gets the clarity that this is what's going to be the remedy. This bringing Our Lady in, declaring her as the Immaculate Conception as those who were advising him, the cardinals told him, this will bring a historic grace to the church. Not only does it do so, but it restores the papacy and it leads to the definition of, the, of a papal infallibility in 1870. Dogmas bring grace. Marian dogmas bring special grace because if we're acknowledging Our Lady's role as the Mediatrix of all graces, oh yes, we can expect exponential historic graces. And it's interesting that the founder of the movement for this fifth Marian dogma, which by the way, my friends, will never go away. It will simply be fulfilled. Uh, there's, you know, uh, one commentator said, yeah, well, this had a role at one point. It might be fading out. It will never fade out. It's not fading out now, quite frankly. It's rather dynamic. But it will never fade out because the Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes when he develops doctrine, when he guides the church to have a greater understanding of a truth. And that's what's happening and has been happening regarding this fifth Marian dogma, Our Lady's relationship with us. So Cardinal Mercier in 1915 started this during World War I for the reason of releasing, of petitioning for, and, and, and having as an effect a historic release of grace, of grace and peace for the world. And the principle is this. When you declare the truth, Jesus sends us grace. Why? Because he calls us, he obliges us, he commissions us, he sends us forth. That's what apostolus means, to preach the truth. And when the truth about his mother is proclaimed, yes, we can expect extraordinary graces. And Mercier understood that. That's why from 1915 to the present time, there's been over 1,200 bishops who have asked the popes to do this. There's been well over, there's been somewhere approximately uh, in, the, in the category of uh, 10 to 12 million petitions. Now, there's been 8 million petitions simply from 1993. But over the course from 1915, Cardinal Mercy himself collected petitions that faithful were sending in petitions. Only the Vatican itself knows how many petitions. But we do know is it's the largest petition drive in the history of the Catholic Church so that the mother will be crowned, so that the Pope will use his charism of infallibility and solemnly declare that she is the spiritual mother of all peoples, including these three roles as co redemptrix mediatrix, and advocate. So number one, a historic release of grace. Number two, it's a completion of Marian dogma. 
as we mentioned, there's the first four dogmas, but none of those dogmas talk about Our Lady's relationship to us. She's quintessentially mother. You know, as Pope Francis says over and over, e madre mia, she's my mother, was the title of his uh, little Marian book. Uh, she's all of our mothers. The fact that that's not solemnly defined uh, means there's an incomplete aspect of the truth about Our Lady. So a solemn definition of Mary's spiritual motherhood would give a theological foundation for all of our devotions. Because why do we consecrate ourselves to Our Lady? Because she's our spiritual mother. Why do we trust in the promise of the scapular that she can intercede for the graces necessary for salvation? Because she's our mother. Why do we do the five first Saturdays at Fatima with the residual promise of the graces necessary for salvation for those who complete them? Because she mediates all graces. Why do we trust in the scapular promise? Because she can back that as having a jurisdiction over all graces. You see, all of our major Marian devotions presuppose this truth. So how appropriate that at this climax of the age of Mary, as John the 23rd categorized this period from uh, the miraculous medal onward from 1830, how appropriate that there be a climactic moment of truth to support, to undergird this climactic devotion climax as well, this, this, this high point, this summit of Marian love. So second reason to complete Marian dogma. Third reason is to proclaim Mary as the co-redemptrix is to say to the whole world that human suffering can be redemptive. Look, I don't need to tell you there's suffering everywhere. It's ubiquitous right now. New forms of suffering, challenging, a family breakdown, God breakdown uh, in terms of our belief in him, of course, uh, new ways by which the youth are lost. I mean, it's a, it's a tragedy. You know, 40% of Americans, 40% of Americans in the recent Gallup poll don't have a single friend that's not online. Not a single friend. It's almost half our country doesn't have a single friend that's not online. This is where we're going. This is why we need these graces. But we're all suffering. And so to proclaim Mary as the human co-redemptrix chosen by God the Father through her immaculate conception prepared to be the perfect partner with Jesus in the redemption, that is to tell the world that human suffering is not wasted. Human suffering is redemptive. Uh, you have more and more countries uh, legitimizing uh, legally, because you can't morally legitimize, euthanasia. Well, that's because they don't understand the, 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 the Christian value of suffering, what it does for us, how it can save souls when we offer it. So a, a papal definition of Our Lady as co-redemptrix, as part of her role as the spiritual mother of all peoples, would tell the world the ultimate Catholic bumper sticker, and that is that suffering is redemptive. Suffering has a value. It purifies us. It saves souls. Uh, number four, the reason why a dogma would benefit the world is because to proclaim what Mary, a human person, did freely is to proclaim the power, the dignity, the honor that God gives to human freedom. Look, Mary's yes, as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, her yes was a yes on behalf of the whole human race. And it was a yes that said, we will cooperate with you, Heavenly Father, to save souls. We will cooperate with your incarnate Son. We will do that. Why? Because St. Augustine is right. God creates us without us, but he can't save us without us. So in this time, when communism is rearing its ugly head once again, where there are dictatorial regi regimes, uh, where you're having uh, re uh, the terrorism uh, re forcing religion. You know, 50,000 50, Nigerian Christians have been killed in the last 10 years, where human freedom is being thwarted. A definition of Our Lady's yes, the power of her yes as a human person, albeit an immaculate human person, would redound to all human freedom, that God so honors human freedom that he wanted a human person involved in the greatest act of all history, which is the redemption of the world. So the, the, the fourth reason is that human uh, dignity would be affirmed in, in, a, in a new and powerful way. 
Number five, the particular role of woman, the feminine genius, as St. John Paul II uh, quoted, would be promulgated that God didn't choose a man, didn't choose a pope, not a bishop, not a priest, but a woman to be the partner in the greatest act of human history, redemption. Uh, there is such a, a flagrant violation of authentic human uh, uh, feminine appreciation, uh, but it's being you know thwarted a lot of times by a radical feminism, which just tries to make a woman be a man. That's a diabolical uh, antithesis of authentic feminine dignity. That, that women have a special place in God's plan and in God's creation that can't be satisfied with a man. That's why John Paul in his Theology of the Body says, humanity was not fully given to us until woman was taken from the rib of man. So authentic human dignity in the particular manifestation of the glory of woman. That again, a woman had the greatest role in human history among what the poets call uh, our human race's solitary boast, uh, that it was the mother. And so we can understand the dignity of woman by focusing on what Mary did and who Mary is. Number six, that a solemn definition regarding Mary's role would be a great contribution to authentic Catholic ecumenism. Now, that might be a head-scratcher to some. They thought, well, wait a minute, I thought ecumenism meant we weren't supposed to say anything that our Protestant Christians didn't, didn't, don't uh, accept and don't hold. Uh, that's an entirely false ecumenism, what John Paul uh, calls a pseudo-ecumenism. Uh, pseudo in Greek means it's a lie. Uh, authentic ecumenism means we dialogue about doctrine, we pray in, as unified as we can, but we also invite all members of different denominations to become members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And it can never, St. John Paul II emphasizes, it can never mean compromising fullness of Catholic doctrine. But John Paul takes it a further step. He says, you can never use ecumenism as a reason to not appreciate development of doctrine. When, we, when the Holy Spirit's guiding it to be even more clear, more pronounced, more profound. And that's what a Marian dogma is. I recall the letter for the fifth Marian dogma by the late Cardinal O'Connor of New York, who said, a Marian dogma would help ecumenism because it would state precisely what we do believe about Mary and also what we don't. That we don't think she's the fourth person of the Trinity. And we don't think that she competes, that she's on a level of quality with Jesus. Again, it's blasphemy and nonsense. But some Protestant Christians believe we hold that. How valuable it would be when we're discussing the authentic teachings of the church regarding Our Lady and her relationship with us as spiritual mother to be able to hand our brother Protestant or sister Protestant Christian uh a papal statement on it. So no, no, this is exactly what we believe. We don't at all believe what you may have heard. Um, as many authors have said, it, it's not the church that is the true Catholic church that is often reviled. It is the church they think the Catholic church is. And any church that would put a human being along the side of God on a level of quality is a church that has serious doctrinal error. It has heresy. That's not the Catholic church. So how valuable it would be if we had a synthesized statement by the Holy Father about Mary's relationship with us. The seventh and final reason, my friends, and I say this with a reverence, it's because Our Lady is asking for this fifth Marian dogma. In over a half dozen authentic Marian private revelations, she has said that this dogma this proclamation is a condition for world peace. Nothing short of that. Why would it be a condition for world peace? Because Jesus wants his mother's role to be recognized, to be reverenced, to be appreciated by the church before she fully exercises that role on our behalf. That's what this fifth Marian dogma would be. It would be the Pope 
who has the keys, representing all of the Catholic faith, and in a certain sense, even representing humanity, in saying, we freely exercise our will to acknowledge Our Lady as the spiritual mother of all peoples. We believe it, and we want the full exercise of that power. Once again, within the species of authentic private revelation, uh, there is one consistent theme, along with the common Marian themes of prayer, rosary, consecration, penance, uh, that cannot be ignored. And that's the theme of a global chastisement, which originally was conditional, but now, uh, according to visionaries like Sister Agnes Sasagawa, in the approved apparitions of uh, Akita, says is no longer uh, avoidable, but can be mitigated through our ongoing prayer and penance. Well, the whole Akita apparitions are a continuation, according to the bishop that approved Akita, Bishop Ito, it's a continuation of the reported uh, Amsterdam apparitions, which for 18 years were approved. And then in 2020, uh, the local bishop made a statement which took it from the approval to the middle category. But that doesn't affect Akita because it's a statue of the Lady of All Nations that weeps 101 times. But it's also a statue uh, that is used for Our Lady to say to the visionary, there is a upcoming chastisement greater than the flood. And this is uh, uh, this message of a conditional global chastisement runs the gamut of the entire Marian message to the modern world. Remember, Fatima, as one of its predictions, says that various nations will be annihilated. That has not yet happened. So this dogma has been posed in many of these messages as the remedy, once again, that with the proclamation of the dogma, Our Lady will be able to fully exercise her functions as co-redemptrix, mediatrix advocate, including mediating peace for the world. So the dogma, as one author said, is the key to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which was prophesied at Fatima. My friends, I, I pray, <clears throat> I pray you don't take this lightly. Um, This is something that's not going to go away just because uh, it gets lower on our priorities. This dogma has to happen, and heaven wants this dogma, and heaven has, (coughs) in various messages, guaranteed that this dogma will take place. In what sense? It has said that the outcome of this dogma is assured. And uh, even Mother Angelica in the live show we did years back said, I don't think much good is going to happen until this fifth Marian dogma is going to be proclaimed. So Mother Teresa was a great supporter of this fifth Marian dogma. But it's very clear in Our Lady's messages, this dogma has to happen. So I ask you, uh, especially in the great month of May, but of course not exclusive to May, I ask you, please, every day, Pray for the heart of Pope Francis and the proclamation of the Fifth Marian Dogma. Pray it as a rosary intention. Pray it when you're at Mass. It's a very, you could even say, you know, for the Fifth Marian Dogma, that's enough. But pray, if, if you will, for the heart of our Holy Father. I beg you not to limit your prayers based on human speculation. Let Our Lady have your prayer and she can multiply your prayer to affect the heart of any Holy Father, including this Holy Father. So I ask you, please pray every day, especially during the month of May, as a special bouquet for Our Lady, pray for the heart of Pope Francis and the fifth Marian dogma. And then let the Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Heart do their work on our Holy Father's heart, who, by the way, loves Our Lady very much. It's very clear he he accepts her as spiritual mother and loves her as such. The rest, let's put to prayer. And one final request, if you have not sent a petition to Pope Francis recently, uh, I ask you to and invite you to send a petition to him. It can be one paragraph. Uh, It can be, Holy Father, please proclaim the Fifth Marian Dogma. Or even, Holy Father, I'm praying for your discernment to to proclaim the Fifth Marian Dogma. He knows clearly about the Fifth Marian Dogma. I've talked to him three times uh, about it. Uh, 
but prayer and petition is the great one-two punch. Uh, how do you send a petition to Pope Francis? Very simple. On an envelope, on the outside, just put Pope Francis, Vatican City, 00120. And if you forget the zip code, guess what? They'll know who you're trying to get to, even if you have just Pope Francis and Vatican City. But just for security, you want to put 00120 to assist with the uh, zip code. Three postage stamps on the inside. Write a line or a paragraph or whatever you want to write. Write from your heart to the Holy Father's heart. Write to what you think would move the Holy Father's heart to proclaim, to crown Our Lady with this fifth Marian dogma so that the graces of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart can be definitively initiated. It's not going to happen until she is acknowledged. That's clear. So for all seven reasons, please do your part. Uh, and again, pray every day at least the intention. Now, of, of all the prayers, I recommend this prayer. Most specifically, this is the prayer of the Lady of All Nations which I believe has a special power to prepare the world uh, for the Fifth Marian Dogma. So uh, look up Fifth Marian, uh, excuse me, look up uh, Lady of All Nations prayer card. Uh, if you want it, we can send it to you free. Uh, give us a call at 740-937-2277 uh, or just email us at mary at motherofallpeoples.com. English, Spanish, how many prayer cards you want. But I, I, I beg you, really, in, in the mother's heart, be a missionary for this, too. You know four or five other people who have an open Marian heart. Pass this word on. Give them a prayer card. You order them and pass them around. And then maybe you can get together, have a rosary, and as a prayer group, you can jointly write uh, your petitions. It's very important that the Holy Father realize that this desire of the Vox Populi of the voice of the people has not strayed at all. In any, if anything, it's gotten more intense because the world scene is more frightening without Our Lady, without our Lord's plan of peace, which essentially includes her. So again, last two action uh, requests. Pray every day during the month of May for the heart of Pope Francis and the Fifth Marian Dogma. I recommend using the prayer of the Lady of All Nations, uh, but it's certainly not limited to that. And if you haven't uh, petitioned recently, write a petition to Pope Francis. Uh, Pope Francis, Vatican City, 00120. Uh, just a line encouraging him to make this proclamation. Uh, so let us end by praying and let's, let's give the mother this bouquet during the month of May as we pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for being with us. God bless you all.